have the opportunity to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. And let me be clear, and let me be clear, after decades in law enforcement, I know the importance of safety and security, especially at our border. Last year, Joe and I brought together Democrats and conservative Republicans to write the strongest border bill in decades. The Border Patrol endorsed it. But Donald Trump believes a border deal would hurt his campaign. So he ordered his allies in Congress to kill the deal. Well, I refuse to play politics with our security. And here is my pledge to you. As president, I will bring back the bipartisan border security bill that he killed, and I will sign it into law. I know, I know we can live up to our proud heritage as a nation of immigrants and reform our broken immigration system. We can create an earned pathway to citizenship and secure our border. And America, we must also be steadfast in advancing our security and values abroad. As Vice President, I have confronted threats to our security, negotiated with foreign leaders, strengthened our alliances, and engaged with our brave troops overseas. As Commander-in-Chief, I will ensure America always has the strongest, most lethal fighting force in the world. And I will fulfill our sacred obligation to care for our troops and their families, and I will always honor and never disparage their service and their sacrifice. on space and artificial intelligence that America, not China, wins the competition for the 21st century and that we strengthen, not abdicate, our global leadership. Trump, on the other hand, threatened to abandon NATO. He encouraged Putin to invade our allies, said Russia could, quote, do whatever the hell they want. Five days before Russia attacked Ukraine, I met with President Zelensky to warn him about Russia's plan to invade. I helped mobilize a global response over 50 countries to defend against Putin's aggression. And as president, I will stand strong with Ukraine and our NATO allies. With respect to the war in Gaza, President Biden and I are working around the clock because now is the time to get a hostage deal and a ceasefire deal done. And let me be clear, and let me be clear, I will always stand up for Israel to defend itself and I will always ensure Israel has the ability to defend itself because the people of Israel must never again face the horror that a terrorist organization called Hamas caused on October 7, including unspeakable sexual violence and the massacre of young people at a music festival. At the same time, what has happened in Gaza over the past 10 months is devastating. So many.
many innocent lives lost. Desperate, hungry people fleeing for safety over and over again. The scale of suffering is heartbreaking. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. And know this, I will never hesitate to take whatever action is necessary to defend our forces and our interests against Iran and Iran-backed terrorists. I will not cozy up to tyrants and dictators like Kim Jong-un, who are rooting for Trump, who are rooting for Trump. Because, you know, they know, they know he is easy to manipulate with flattery and favors. They know Trump won't hold autocrats accountable because he wants to be an autocrat himself. And as president, I will never waver in defense of America's security and ideals because in the enduring struggle between democracy and tyranny, I know where I stand and I know where the United States belongs. country with all my heart. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go in everyone I meet, I see a nation that is ready to move forward, ready for the next step in the incredible journey that is America. I see an America where we hold fast to the fearless belief that built our nation and inspired the world. That here, in this country, anything is possible. That nothing is out of reach. An America where we care for one another, look out for one another and recognize that we have so much more in common than what separates us. That none of us, none of us has to fail for all of us to succeed. And that in unity there is strength. You know, our opponents in this race are out there every day denigrating America, talking about how terrible everything is. Well, my mother had another lesson she used to teach. Never let anyone tell you who you are. You show them who you are. Let us show each other and the world who we are and what we stand for. Freedom, opportunity, compassion, dignity, fairness, and endless possibilities. We are the heirs to the greatest democracy in the history of the world. And on behalf of our children and our grandchildren and all those who sacrificed so dearly for our freedom and liberty, we must be worthy of this moment. It is now our turn to do what generations 
before us have done. Guided by optimism and faith to fight for this country we love, to fight for the ideals we cherish, and to uphold the awesome responsibility that comes with the greatest privilege on earth, the privilege and pride of being an American. in the most extraordinary story ever told. Thank you. God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you all. Vice President Kamala Harris speaking on the final day of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. She has formally accepted the nomination as the Democratic presidential nominee. She made a pitch to the voters and narrated her unexpected path. She started her speech by talking about how her mother taught her to do something about injustice and mentioned, mentioned her Indian roots. She also explained all the experiences that helped shape her into the lawmaker, the woman and the presidential contestant that she is today. Harris is the first black woman and first Asian American to lead a major party ticket. Her speech was pegged on unity and asserted her phrase Kamala for the people and promised to be the president for the whole of America. She also took a dig at Trump and said that this was not, that he was not a serious man. And the consequences of putting Trump in the White House is extremely concerning. Kamala Harris touched upon various issues from reproductive rights, economy, border issues, and climate crisis. Well, she also mentioned the two wars that the world is facing at the moment, the Ukraine-Russia war and the Israel-Hamas war. She spoke about Trump's stance on NATO and asserted U.S.'s strong commitment towards Ukraine. On the war in West Asia, she mentioned that this was the time and the urgency on a hostage and ceasefire deal and also outlined U.S.'s support for Israel to defend itself from Hamas. And that was Kamala Harris's biggest political night of her career. She just delivered a keynote address on the final night of and day four of the DNC, which has just culminated in Chicago. And to talk more on Kamala Harris's historic speech at the DNC, we are now being joined by Susan Therani on the phone line. Hi, Susan. A lot of points made by Kamala Harris. What exactly stood out for you? Take us uh, through the uh, major highlights of her speech. And do you think that Harris managed to convince the voters that she can perhaps be the 47th president of the USA? 
Yeah, Harris really had a tough task in front of her, considering the fact that she's part of the Biden administration. And a lot of the policies that she spoke about, some voters might say, well, you are still part of the administration. How is it that those changes haven't been made, notably regarding border security? She talked about that. She said she's going to be tough on border. We know she was in charge of the border and the crisis right now remains. She also talked about an economy that's for everyone. Uh, that's going to be scrutinized to see what policies economically she's going to put forward, considering the fact that she uh, had put some forward and got criticized even by those within her own party. I thought it was very interesting that she talked about the Gaza conflict. She said Palestinians need uh, their rightful home, and that really got the crowd cheering. It just shows where the Democrats are standing right now regarding this. And remember, they're, you know, in Chicago... Uh, there are Michigan voters that are very concerned about the Palestinian issues. So she had to touch upon that. Now, how much she was able to convince uh, voters that aren't already converted is it, hard to know. But her real test is really going to start starting tomorrow. Right, Susan, uh, like you also mentioned, she mentioned the two wars that the world is witnessing right now, the Ukraine-Russia war and the Israel-Hamas war, and she asserted her commitment and U.S.'s stance for Ukraine and for Israel. Now, in the past, she did give a cold shoulder to Nathan Yahoo. However, on the stage today and just uh, moments before, she reaffirmed her support for Israel and Israel's right to defend itself. So what exactly changed in the past couple of weeks? The Biden administration and Harris is part of that. They're trying to walk a fine line to have their cake and eat it too as well. They're so concerned about the pro-Palestinian vote that they might have lost the track of the Jewish vote. And considering the fact that Kamala Harris had an option for a Jewish vice president, Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, and she didn't go with him, that sort of eared the Jewish community as well, the American Jewish community. So she has to toe this fine line. I mean, America's policy is generally pretty straightforward when it comes to Israel. Uh, but it just shows how difficult it is for her and how much her campaign is concerned about those uncommitted voters within her own party. Right, Susan, thank you so much for joining us on the show with your insights.